Greetings. I am Brother Judah, a member of the Nazarene Messianic Party or the NMP. We like to welcome you to our podcast, What is to be Done? We are a organization that deal with the Bible or approach the Bible from a social political perspective. We are actually a social political organization and the Bible <clears throat> we use historically as well as our foundations. And we argue that the Bible should be approached and understood from a social political perspective because it, its content uh, is, is filled with social activities, political economy, nations, kingdoms, peoples, and how they conduct themselves one towards another and how they should also conduct themselves one towards another for the administration of justice. So when we mention the Bible, we don't want people to uh, misunderstand and believe that we are approaching the Bible from a Western religious perspective. We're not. And our discussion today that we um, want to follow up with is looking at love uh, as either a religious uh, sentiment or a force that brings forth liberation. So our title today is Liberating the Oppressed, the Love Force and Class Struggle. Liberating the oppressed, the love force and class struggle. So what we have been doing <clears throat> is analyzing uh, the teaching of charity or love in which you find in your or in our Bibles. However, this teaching of charity in our Bibles have been uh, pretty much given to us or taught to us from the perspective of Western so-called Christianity. What we would like to do today is to see if the teachings of the Apostle Paul, if these teachings here in Corinthians and his reference to love can be applied and fit neatly into the context of revolu revolutionary struggle, then I think that uh, we should take another look at what we have been taught of the, out of the Bible. We're going to look into 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're gonna to go to verse four. And we covered a few things before, but today we're going to go right to the verse, verse four for our uh, discussion today. And I'm going to read out of the King James Version, which we also use. I will also be making a reference or reading out of the Stones edition of the Tanakh and also out of the MCT Brit Kadasha Interlinear. Hebrew New Testament of the Holy Scripture. Our goal is to broaden the perspective of love and to recognize that love isn't a sentiment in its totality, if you will. Love, true love, is according to the apostle moral preference and he's going to explain this moral preference now if your emotional sentiment finds comfort in the moral preference that is described in, in uh, corinthians then you're doing well but to go off your just or just to uh uh go off of the emotional sentiment or even a religious emotional sentiment could be uh, rather misleading. So 
if we look in Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, out of the interlinear, it reads, love is patient, is kind, love not, is envious, love not, is boastful, not, is puffed up. So what they're saying here in this literal translation, love is patient and it is kind. It is not envious. It is not boastful. It is not puffed up. Or simply, it isn't egotistic. It doesn't thrive. This moral standard doesn't thrive or find any place for egoism nor jealousy or being a braggart. Now, these words in particular carry pretty much the same meaning, and that is envious, boastful, and puffed up, tied directly into egoism. But there are two, three words, primarily two, that it is important for us to look into depth. And that is love itself. What is it? And oftentimes people uh, resort to their feelings. Well, that could be misleading. Now, if we go by this text, love, agape, is 26 in the Greek. 26, number 26 in the Greek numbering system dictionary. Agape. Agape, love, goodwill. Okay. So let's find out a little bit more about this as we investigate the word study. Properly, love, properly, love which, which centers in moral preference. So properly, agape is love which centers in moral preference. So it is your, not just a emotional sentiment, but it is an emotional sentiment, if you will, that is centered in a moral preference. It also says, so too in secular Greek or secular ancient Greek, agape focuses on preference. Likewise, the verb form 25 in a, a numbering system, agapeo, in antiquity meant to prefer. Now, we want to look into this, a moral preference. So what he's arguing here, what, the, uh, what he's arguing bear with me a moment, is that love is making reference to a moral preference, a moral preference. So we're signifying something inside of the conscience something inside of the conscience. This is where the moral preference should be. And this moral preference is patient. Patient. This moral preference should carry the quality. The conscience should embody this quality of patience. And what is that? What is patience? Macrothomio, rachmothomio. So rachmothomio means to persevere, to be patient. Thirty-one fourteen in the Greek, long-tempered, refusing to retaliate with anger because of human reasoning. And this is where most uh, theolo theolo theologians and uh, religious authorities of the West leave you. But we want to look at to persevere. Now, 
even if they argue refusing to retaliate with anger. That will sort of be rather difficult when you analyze the anger of the historical Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua ben Dawid. When he walked into the temple and turned over the tables of the money changers, he also uh, demonstrated anger when he had discourses and exchanges with the scribes and the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So leaving the people here, refusing to retaliate with anger, uh, isn't really scriptorial because the Bible says you can be angry, but don't sin. So what we want to do is go back a little bit, or should we say move up back to this definition to persevere, to be patient. We will agree, of course, that in certain cases, you know, you don't have to retaliate with anger, but it isn't limited to that. And that's part of our discussion today, to persevere, to be patient. So the moral ethic or the moral preference, the moral preference of agape is to be patient or in our King James Bible, it says to be long suffering or suffering long. And so when we're looking at this patience, it means to persevere. But then we also have another word, it is kind, it is kind. And so just as we learn more about love that it is a, a, a sentiment in the conscience that is based upon moral preferences. Now this moral preference should be, should persevere. It should be, uh, as the King James Bible say, long suffering. It should be able to endure. That's gonna be necessary. And we're gonna look at this in a particular context of liberating, of the liberating force or using this idea of this moral preference of being able to persevere, looking at it in the context of liberation struggles and how this quality or this character is essential and needed in liberation struggles. Then we find this word kind, 5541 in the Greek, 5541 in the Greek. And it, it, the, uh, uh, it means to be kind. Okay. Cres yo omi, cres yo omi, or cres yo omai, cres yo omai means to be kind. But if we scroll down to the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, it adds a little bit more. To show oneself useful. So this word to be kind also means to show oneself useful. That is act benevolently, be kind to act benevolently. Now, if we look benevolent up in the um, Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, benevolent carries the definition of marked by or disposed to doing good, marked by or disposed to doing good. Then it further says about benevolent, organized for the purpose of doing good, organized for the purpose of doing good. So when we're looking at this again, in this text, love is a moral preference. This moral preference perseveres and it is kind. In other words, this is a moral preference within your moral preference and within your conscience. You're disposed to doing good or also organized for the purpose of doing good. So your moral preference will compel you 
to organize for the purpose of doing good. And in your doing good, it is not, it's not envious. It isn't jealous or covetous or desires what other wants. You're not doing your deeds or your works for the sake of covetousness. See, you have some people who may struggle for liber who, who claim that they're struggling for righteous or righteous liberation, but primarily they're struggling against the powers because they're oppressed. But in exchange, if they were to re remove from the oppressed class to the more well-to-do class or the rich, rich class or aristocratic class, then this whole struggle for liberation, it loses its win. A similar, uh, uh, similar, similar to this is a read, is something that I read about Benito Mussolini. In the beginning, Benito Mussolini was a socialist and Benito Mussolini had, you know, he was also a journalist and he wrote and argue in behalf of the working class people. But some of his contemporaries and his cadres argue that Benito Mussolini was really puffed up and boastful. He wanted to exemplify that he is the man. And it was later revealed that Benito Mussolini was very much envious of the aristocratic class. So when the aristocratic class was able to persuade him by bribes, it was manifested that he was envious. He just wanted a piece of the pie. He wanted a part of the bag. He really didn't care for the liberation struggle. And when they offered him a way to um, partake in the wealth, Benito Mussolini became a fascist. And he went from supporting labor workers and rights to ruthlessly condemning them and brutally subduing them. And Mussolini received his, his, um, his rewards as a supporter of the capitalist class and eventually went on to move forward in support of fascist um, activities. So this is the deal with love or this moral preference that it must be, first of all, persevering. It must be willing to organize for the purpose of doing good. This moral preference, which some Bibles call love, some Bibles call charity, it must not be envious and it cannot be boastful or puffed up. This is necessary. So what I'm arguing here is that the apostle Paul is using this, 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 this the, these fundamentals and the basis for the building of what some will call the Christian, Christian movement or the messianic movement or the movement of the Nazarenes. And this movement have been put in motion by a so-called peasant prophet out of Galilee. And the goal or the trajectory is to seize upon the earth and bring forth a social renovation. And this social renovation will bring justice and equity to all mankind. Now, in order to take up this task, the argument first is that we must have this moral ethic or this moral um, uh, uh, preference that is persevering and that is willing to organize for the purpose of doing good or dispose into doing good. And this is what we get this word kind from. This is where we get this word kind. Now, let me give you an example of how this could be applied. Out of Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. In the edition that I have, I'll be going to page 89. In the edition that I have, we'll be going to the page 89. 
Now, but, but even before I read this, I also want to bring also clarity when we're looking at love, it says moral preference. So uh, again, for those who probably didn't hear the first uh, podcast on this subject, uh, morals, we went into morals and morals is, if you will, according to the Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, morals is of or relating to the principles of right and wrong. Morals is of or relating to the principles of right and wrong in behavior, ethical judgments. So this moral preference is relating to the principles of knowing right and wrong and is also directly tied into ethical judgments. Now, what are ethics? Ethics or ethic, the discipline, dealing with what is good and bad and with moral duty and obligation. Dealing, the discipline dealing with what is good and bad and with moral duty and obligation. So ethics involve activity. You are moved or compelled by your moral preference or your moral ethic to move in behalf or disposed to perform deeds that are right because morals is, re, is, is relating to the principles of right, right and wrong. And this brings us into ethical judgment and ethical judgment is the discipline of dealing with what is good and bad. So this, is, this takes place in our conscience. So we must know what is good and bad. This will define our ethic and we're examining the ethic of Corinthians. And so what we're talking about now, we're looking at what is good and what is bad. And one thing they're saying is bad is be, to be envious. One thing this moral ethic is saying is not tolerable is to be boastful and puffed up. This is contrary to the moral ethic in which the apostle is explaining here. Now let's look at something here in the footnote as well, but I want to read something. Page 89 of Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Paulo Freire argues this about love. Love is an act of courage. Now, why would he argue love is an act of courage? Because love is patient and is kind. So this moral ethic is built upon benevolence, because that's what kindness means, benevolence. And this moral ethic is the discipline of dealing with what is good and, with, and what is bad, and the moral duty and obligation to perform what is good. So when Friere is saying love is an act of courage, yes, it takes courage oftentimes to do what is good and to organize for the purpose of doing good. So he says here, love is an act of courage, not of fear. Love is commitment to others. Love is commitment to others. How long of a commitment? Well, love is patience, so therefore it perseveres. Paulo Freire says, no matter where the oppressed are found, the act of love is committed to their cause, the cause of liberation, the cause of liberation. Now, he's going to read an excerpt here from the uh, Vinceramos, the speeches and writings of Che Guevara, edited by John Garassi, New York. 1969, page 398. And notice this as it gives us a context of the demonstration of love. It reads, quote, I am more and more convinced that true revolutionaries must perceive the revolution because of its creative and liberating nature as an act of love. 
comment. Now, he's saying here that Trey Rivera is arguing that he's more and more convinced that true revolutionaries must perceive revolution as an act of love. Why? Because he, Paulo Freire agrees, because he argues, he says, no matter where the oppressed are found, the act of love is commitment to their cause, the cause of liberation. So if we're looking at this here with Che Rivera, again, he says, I am more and more convinced that true revolutionaries must perceive the revolution because of its creative and liberating nature as an act of love. For me, the revolution, which is not possible without a theory of revolution, common. And that's where the Bible comes in. This is where we're arguing where the Bible comes in. It's a revolutionary catechism. And it teaches us the theory of revolution. I'll continue to read it. And therefore, science. For me, the revolution, which is not possible without a theory of revolution, and therefore science, is not irreconcilable with love. On the contrary, the revolution is made by people to achieve their humanization. What indeed is the deeper motive which moves individuals to become revolutionaries? But the dehumanization of people? Common. So he's saying, what moves people? What is the deeper motive which moves individuals to become revolutionaries? Because the revolution is made by people to achieve their humanization. So what moves people to become revolutionaries? None other than the dehumanization of people. When you see people dehumanized, you want to make a change. That we're going to the definition of kind, acts of benevolence, organized for the purpose of doing good. Restoring one's humanization is an act of doing good, wouldn't you say? It would be an act of kindness. And you should be persistent. You should be, you should persevere. We should persevere because if we're doing it based upon our moral preference, it's long suffering. We're going to fight until the war is won. Back to the reading. The distortion imposed on the word, quote, love, unquote, by the capitalist world cannot prevent the revolution from being essentially loving in character. Nor can it prevent the revolutionaries from affirming their love of life. Let me say, with the risk of appearing ridiculous, that the true revolutionary is guided by strong feelings of love. It is impossible to think of an authentic revolutionary without this quality. Without the quality of what? Love or charity, right? or a more preference, a more preference specifically that is patient or that perseveres, long suffering. Long suffering in what? In kindness and benevolence, a moral ethic, a discipline in dealing with what is good and bad and with the moral duty and obligation to bring forth the good and to subdue the bad. The principles of right and wrong and ethical judgment and behavior. This is truly the essence of a revolutionary. What the apostle saw here is bringing is the essence of a revolutionary and the so-called Christian church or the Nazarenes that he was making reference to then was the incubator of revolutionaries. 
creating what the prophetic language described as the messianic body. The purpose of the messianic body is to bring justice and judgment into the earth, break in pieces the oppressor, remove the ruling class, and bring forth right rulings of justice, judgment, and equity into the earth, bringing forth a social revolution, a social renovation. Where's the abolition of class, the abolition of ethnic divide, the abolition of gender divide. These are the teachings that are found in the revolutionary works of the text we call the Holy Bible. Now, in this sense of the acts of charity and the revolution, or as Paulo Freire just summed up what Che Rivera was saying, true love is an act of courage or love is an act of courage, not of fear. Love is commitment to others. No matter where the oppressed are found, the act of love is committed to their cause, the cause of liberation. Let's analyze this a bit. Let's take our journey into the Tanakh. And I will be reading out of the strong, I mean, the Stones edition of the Tanakh. In the Stones edition of the Tanakh, I want to uh, pick our reading up in Isaiah 58, the Stones edition of the Tanakh. Isaiah 58 is what I want to bring. And remember, as we analyze Isaiah 58, it's something that I also want you to take into serious consideration. And that is what we just read out of Paulo Freire's work. Love or charity or the moral ethic in which the apostle Saul is arguing because that's agape, love, translated love, agape, translated love. It is simply moral preference. Morals is built upon the principles of right and wrong, ethical judgment, ethics, dealing with the discipline of right and wrong, dealing with that discipline, ethic, dealing with the discipline of what is good and bad and with moral duty and obligation to address it. Now, if we apply this theory and look at it in the sense of revolution, are we going outside of the text? Well, that's why I decided to go to the text, Isaiah chapter 58. In Isaiah chapter 58, I'll start reading at verse six. Notice carefully, this is out of the Stones edition, but if you're using a King James, same deal, same thing. It says, surely this is the fast I choose to break open the shackles of wickedness. And what might they be? What are the shackles of wickedness? to break open the shackles of wickedness, to undo the bonds of injustice. Is this not the fast that Yehoah said he have chosen? To break open the shackles of wickedness? To undo the bonds of injustice? Sound like revolution to me. And to let the oppressed go free or to bring humanization back to people? and annul the perversion. Surely you should break your bread to the hungry and bring the moaning poor. Who are the moaning poor? They are the ones who were bound in injustice. The moaning poor are those who were oppressed and enslaved. Bring the moaning poor to your home. When you see a naked person, clothe him. Why were they naked? Verse seven is directly tied into six. 
They were naked because of injustice. The moaning poor were moaning because of injustice and oppression and because of perversion. So now the task is to liberate them and let the oppressed go free. Surely you should break your bread to the hungry and bring the moaning poor to your home. When you see a naked person, clothe him and do not hide yourself from your kin. Oh, food, shelter, and clothing are directly tied into to break open the shackles of wickedness and undo the bonds of injustice and to let the oppressed go free and annul all perversion. Once oppression or the oppressed, they're liberated. And once the bonds of injustice are broken, then the oppressed go free. And once the oppressed go free, we will annul all perversion. And this will bring food, shelter, and clothing to the dehumanized. Is this, according to the prophet Isaiah, this demonstration? Would this demonstration line right up with the demonstration of love in 1 Corinthians 13 and 4 if we analyze it from a revolutionary perspective? That's what we're reading about here to break or to burst these shackles or the bonds of injustice and let the oppressed go free. That's an act of love. Free air, put it this way. Love is an act of courage. It takes courage to do it. Break the bands of oppression, to let the oppressed go free, to break the shackles of injustice. Love is an act of courage, not of fear. Love is a commitment to others. We must be committed to people. We must be committed to people in order to fulfill what he says here in Isaiah. Surely the fast in which y'all have chosen, we must be committed to people to break open the shackles of wickedness and undo the bonds of injustice and to let the oppressed go free. To deal bread to the hungry and to bring the moaning poor to your home. And when you see a naked person, clothe him and do not hide yourself from your kin, your kinsmen, your fellow human being. This is a demonstration of love, a commitment to others. So Friere says, no matter where the oppressed are found, the act of love is commitment to their cause, the cause of liberation. Or as Isaiah said, let the oppressed go free. Whose job is that? The messianic body's job. But the messianic body's job is clear once we understand it in its proper context. However, the infiltration of imposters who call themselves Christians, which is spoken of in the Hebrew Bible. And for the sake of it, let us look at it. An example of what I'm making reference to can be found in Matthew. A lot of people call themselves Christians. Because Western Christianity is evil. I mean, it's easy and is evil. All you got to do is confess, literally, with the pronunciation of words and not really understand what confession entails. But you just say a few words and shed a few tears. And then someone pronounce you saved. You say a few clever words, you give a sermon, and someone pronounce you a prophet. But look what the master teacher argued here in Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse 18, or should I say 
16. In fact, let's go in. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? What are they producing? What are all of the religious institutions producing? Whether they're so-called Hebrew Israelite, whether they're so-called Methodist, Episcopalian, what I mean, Episcopalian or um, so-called Jehovah Witness or whatever your religions, Baptist, Pentecostal, whatever it is, what are they actually producing? Beware of false prophets. Now, now notice why he's arguing this. Even so, verse 17, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth good fruit is hewn down. Excuse me, every tree that bringeth forth not, every tree that bringeth not forth, excuse me, good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. Not everyone, this is, this is it. Identifying the false messengers. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not? Proclaim the name of Jesus or proclaim the name of Yeshua or proclaim the name of Yahweh, whatever. You seem fit to call him. Closest to the Hebrew or the Greek or the Latin. Many will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. But then will I profess unto them. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, you that work iniquity, he said, depart from me. He that works iniquity, depart. Why? Who are they? Well, many coming in the name of Jesus, Yeshua. But he said, you that work iniquity, depart. So it's very important for us to realize what's being taught to us. Now, the historical Jesus of Nazareth sent the people on the mission. He sent people on the mission to change the world, not to start a religion. He sent them on a mission to change the world. Now, we're looking at these these acts of love. Let's go further with this. Let's go further with this. Verse five. Now, the acts of charity, it isn't unbecomingly or unseemly in our Bibles, it reads. It isn't or it doesn't seek things of its own. The acts of charity does not seek its own. Why? Because the moral preference of those who are following the, uh, 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 this, uh, this ethic of agape, according to the passages we're reading, it seeks not its own, but it is kind. It has this moral ethic of organizing for the sake of doing good. It's not out for its own. Therefore, it isn't envious. It isn't boastful. Enviousness and covetousness and boastfulness and being puffed up or prideful, these are all characteristics for those who seek their own. Well, and they are all acts that are acts of unbecomingly or unseemly. No, this isn't this moral preference or ethic that the apostle Saul is teaching these revolutionaries. 
They must sacrifice themselves. They must stand in the cause of the poor and afflicted. They must abolish ego. They must abolish egoism. They can't seek their own. They're not easily provoked and does, and, uh, and does not or not it keep account of wrongs. So it doesn't act in evilness. So let's look at this in our, if you're looking at our King James. So let's, let's read this. And our King James, these unseemly acts that this moral preference that the Apostle Paul is teaching about should be done away with. And how he says here, charity or this moral ethic does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, and thinketh no evil, or keep, or it does not keep account of wrongs or evils. So therefore, we're looking at this moral preference or this discipline, this ethic, this moral ethic of dealing with what is good and what is bad and our moral duty and obligation. And one of the moral duties and obligation, according to Isaiah 58, is break the bands of oppression and break the bands of injustice and let the oppressed go free. To do that, it takes perseverance or long suffering or suffering long. And it takes acts of kindness or benevolence or the organization for the purpose of doing good to fulfill these deeds. That's why Che Guevara argued that revolution in this essence is loving in character. That's why Jose Miranda said love is an act of courage and that those who are in true love they stand on the call, they stand for the cause of the oppressed. Wherever the oppressed are, they're there by their side for the sake of liberation, for the sake of, as he says, no matter where the oppressed are found, the act of love is commitment to their cause, the cause of liberation, just as Isaiah 58 described. Now, I believe is very important for us to analyze and critique this love. And we have other words in, in, the, in the future, God willing, we will address that have uh, been used and the full definition haven't been giving, given concerning words like meekness, uh, words like gentleness. It's been given to us in this, um, in, in a way in which the people are undermined and doing the true work of the gospel uh, because they don't know the depth of these words of meekness and gentleness, love or charity, kindness, acts of benevolence. If you place these words in a certain context, you can subdue people and bring people into bondage and they will remain in that bondage if you use these words out of context. But we're reading the context of letting the oppressed go free and breaking the bonds of injustice. That's why we're using this in this context, because that is none other than, than revolutionary acts. Now, with that being said, perseverance, perseverance is necessary. Let me go back up a bit because I don't want to leave this one out. Perseverance, patient, charity or agape or your moral preference must have patience to persevere, to persevere. Now watch this. Let's, let us analyze this, perseverance. Let us look at this in Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50. And I'll be reading this out of the King James Bible. Isaiah chapter 50. Let's look at the demonstration of patience, of perseverance. And let's look at the context it's using again. Because when we looked at the acts of benevolence, letting the oppressed go free and breaking the bonds of liberation or breaking the bonds of injustice, bringing liberation to the 
pour that moan, we're looking at revolutionary acts right out of the Bible. But then we find this here in Isaiah chapter 50. And notice this in Isaiah 50. And I'll read, I'll start reading at verse 7. Isaiah 50 and verse 7. It says, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is, he, he is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let them come near. Now, in fact, I started a little late because I said verse five. So bear with me. Verse five reads, the Lord God hath opened mine ear and I was not rebellious, neither turn away back. I did not turn away from his message. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. This is also makes reference to, also makes reference to the messianic uh, body. This makes reference to the messengers whom the creator have sent. And it's also used to make reference to the Messiah who had been born of Miriam the historical Jesus of Nazareth or Yeshua ben Dawid. They had suffered persecution. The messengers of Elohim have suffered persecution. If we just argue from the standpoint of this being the historical Jesus of Nazareth, who says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. And I hid not my face from shame and spitting. He argues the same thing. He said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you in the book of John. He also says in John 14 and 12, the works that I do, you shall do. John 17, he also explains, actually, if you read from John chapter 12, all the way to John chapter 17, you will find his, his discourse and explaining to them, they're going to kill you and think they're doing God a service. Your backs also will be given to the smiters. Your cheeks would also be given to those who pluck off the hair. But if we're going with this uh, message in Corinthians, they shall persevere through it, though. They shall be patient. Look what he says. Perseverance. Even though he has suffered the persecution of shame and spitting, he said, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore, shall I not be confounded? Therefore, have I set my face like flint? And I know that I shall not be ashamed. Why? He's not turning back. Perseverance. He's not turning back. What he did, he hath told us to do. And what exactly was he sent to do? To break the bands of oppression, Luke chapter four. But we won't read it today. Now this elect servant who shall come forward in patience and long suffering and standing for the cause of the afflicted, breaking the bands of oppression, he shall persevere Look what he says in Isaiah chapter 42. As we just follow up one more example of perseverance or patience. Isaiah 42. And we get to Isaiah 42. Notice carefully. Notice very carefully. What will be brought to our attention. Here in Isaiah the 42nd chapter. Behold my servant whom I, whom I uphold. Mine elect in whom my soul delighted. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth justice.
to the nations. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Oh, he won't be boastful. He won't be covetous. He will not be puffed up. So this is a demonstration of the characteristic of a revolutionary in revolution where he's not concerned with his own pride and egoism. And that's what we're going to look into next. He have killed the ego. Verse three, a bruised reed shall he not break and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Why? Because the moral ethic of agape, which we call charity or love, rejoices in truth. And that is found where about. Agape, not delight at unrighteousness, rejoices, however, in the truth. We're going to read it, actually. However, what we want to look at now is this not seeking its own, not following ego, and also what we're bringing out at this moment, this agape is patient. So therefore, he says, he shall not fail nor be discouraged. He shall not fail, verse 4, nor be discouraged till he have set justice in the earth. And the isle shall wait for his Torah or his law. He shall, he shall not fail nor be discouraged until he has set forth justice in the earth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged. What is this describing? Patience. Patience in the revolutionary struggle. He should not fail nor be discouraged until he have set judge, judgment or justice in the earth. And for the record, let us go and look at this again. Out of the stones, Tanakh. It reads in verse one, behold my servant whom I, who I shall uphold, my chosen one whom my soul desired. I have placed my spirit upon him so he can bring forth justice to the nations. He will not shout, nor raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. He will not break even a bruised reed, nor extinguish even flickering flax, but he will administer justice and truth. So this is imagery of not raising his voice, not being loud and boisterous, not being puffed up or boastful. But instead, he will bring forth what? He will administer justice and truth because he shall bring forth justice to the nations. Verse four reads, he will not slacken nor tire until he sets justice in the lands and islands, will long for his teachings. He will not slack nor tire until he sets justice in the land and islands will long for his teaching, perseverance, patience, and the administration of justice. And the administration of justice, just as Isaiah said, or as we read in the book of Isaiah, break the bonds of injustice and set the oppressed free. These are qualities in Corinthians that are applied to revolutionaries for, and if they uh, 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 internalize these characteristics or internalize this moral ethic and moral um, preference, then this equips them to be successful and guarantees them the victory and the revolution. But they have to kill egoism. 
before we go forward, we almost um, there with our um, discussion for today. And uh, I would like to examine a little bit more about um, this egoism. 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 And when we're looking at this, this idea of egoism, I want to read out of an article entitled the, A Great Beginning, June 28, 1919. These are articles and speeches from men who had the moral ethic to stand for the cause of the poor wherever they were found. And they says this, it says this, it is the beginning of a revolution that is more difficult, more tangible, more radical, and more decisive than the overthrow of the bourgeoisie or the oppressor. I added oppressor. That's who the bourgeoisie is. For it is a victory over our own conservatism. Comment. Conservatism is making reference to not wanting to change and you want to stay in your old ways or keep the old way. You're not willing to bring forth the new, but you rest in the old. As the Messiah said, you like the old wine bottles. Old wine bottles can't handle no new wine. Old wine bottles consist of those who are entrapped in their own conservatism. Back to the reading. For it is a victory over our own conservatism, indiscipline, petty bourgeois egoism, a victory over the habits left as a heritage to the worker and peasant by accursed capitalism. Isn't that something? The beginning of the revolution is we must get rid of our own conservatism, our own indiscipline, and petty bourgeois egoism. So therefore, this is exactly what the apostle Paul is arguing, that love is kind and patient. It perseveres in the acts of benevolence, but is not puffed up, is not boastful, neither does it seek its own because He's telling us that we must overcome our indiscipline and our petty bourgeois egoism. We must overcome our egos. We must overcome our indiscipline in order for us to be equipped for the revolution. These bad characteristics and qualities that have been given to us, as Lenin argued, by accursed capitalism. Ego must be crushed. Egoism must be removed. Okay? Now, with that being said, now notice what else he's arguing. With this charity or agape, not delight at unrighteousness, rejoices, however, in the truth. Unrighteousness is a dikia, 93. And if we look at a dikia, it's 225, I'm excuse me, uh, 93 in our um, Strong's number system concordance dictionary. Aletheia is actually truth, 225. This moral preference rejoice, however, over the truth. And the truth is true realities. It rejoice over true realities. When you begin to learn and understand the truth, you will rejoice. But if you are stuck or confined to our conservatisms, if we're stuck and confined to our own sect and we're sectarians, then we will reject truth and we will stay in illusions and delusions. And the creator will send us strong delusions and what we will wind up believing in our lives. Like what we're saying today is different. Now, some could reject it or some could research it and learn it and then 
figure out whether they want to follow it or not. Some will reject it right out, don't even understand it because they never really searched it out. They believe they understood it, but they, they never really searched it out. So they may stick to their own conservatisms. But what we're looking at today is adikia, adikia, excuse me. And this is injustice. Now, let me read this out of the um, Hebrew interlinear of the apostle writings and letters. And Corinthians chapter 13. Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 6 reads, it reads, in fact, let me start from verse 4. The love is long-suffering and beneficially kind. The love does not just jealously desire. The love, or this moral preference, does not brag. It is not puffed up does not behave improperly, does not seek its own, is not swiftly provoked, and is not reckoning the wrong. They don't think upon the wrong or evil. But this is what it does. Verse six, it does not rejoice over the injustice, or should I say, as it continues, it does not rejoice. What it does is rejoice in justice. It rejoices in equity, but it does not rejoice over the injustice, but it rejoices together with the truth. So this moral ethic does not rejoice over the injustice. And this moral ethic does not condone egoism. Thus, as Free Air says, love is an act of courage, not of fear. Love is commitment to others. No matter where the oppressed are found, the, love, the act of love is commitment to their cause, the cause of liberation. And if we could bring out what Trey, uh, Che Guevara says, I am more and more convinced that true revolutionaries must perceive the revolution because of its creative and liberating nature as an act of love, as an act of love. He also says, but the, de uh, the distortion imposed on the word, quote, love, unquote, by the capitalist world cannot prevent the revolution from being essentially loving in character, nor can it prevent the revolutionaries from affirming their love of life. Let me say, with the risk of appearing ridiculous, that the true revolutionary is guided by strong feelings of love. It is impossible to think of an authentic revolutionary without this quality. So if I argue that, listen, the Bible is a revolutionary catechism and that they're calling us a revolution. And all of the people who claim that they believe the Bible and they say that they're not revolutionaries and no, they don't believe this apply, then I'm willing to wager and argue. I'm willing to argue that they don't love either. They have not brought themselves to agape and their moral preference isn't according to the moral preference of the Holy Scriptures. And I'm willing to argue that. So far, as we begin to close for this episode, love is persevering. It is selfless. It finds itself in altruism, selflessness. It doesn't seek its own. It does not rejoice or delight in injustice, but it holds fast to the truth. It is moved upon the acts of benevolence, the acts of the moral ethic of judgment and determining what is right and wrong. 
and disposed to organize for the sake of doing what is right and what is good. Isaiah 58 told us what was right and what was good. Break the bands of, a, of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Vladimir Lenin argues this. Here in uh, the task of the Youth League, the task of the Youth League. I want to read an excerpt here. Dealing with morals, morals. He says, I first of all shall deal here with the question of communist ethics. I will deal with the, with the question of communist ethics. He further says, But is there such a thing as communist ethics? Is there such a thing as communist morality? Of course there is. It is, it is often suggested that we have no ethics of our own. Very often the bourgeoisie accuses us communists of rejecting all morality. This is a method of confusing the issue of throwing dust in the eyes of the workers and peasants. <clears throat> Excuse me. In what sense do we reject ethics, reject morality? In what sense? So I want you to understand, comment. I want you to understand what sense he's explaining. So we won't hear partial, but understand its context. The people say, oh, well, you know, they say, see, they say they don't believe in God. Look at the context here. He said, in what sense do we, do we reject ethics? What sense do we reject morality? He already said we have ethics and morality, but I'm going to give you the context in which we reject it. This is what Lenin is saying. And this is the context in which they reject ethic and morality or ethics and morality. Back to the reading. In the sense given to it, by the bourgeoisie who based ethics on God's commandments. On this point, we, of course, say that we do not believe in God. Comment. On what point? On the point, on the sense given to ethics and morality based on the words, uh, 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 based on God's ethics given to us by the bourgeoisie. They're arguing against the bourgeoisie or the ruling class or the capitalist sense of ethics based on God's commandments. This is what he's saying they reject. Now watch as he explains. Back to the reading. In what sense do we reject ethics, reject morality in the sense given to it by the bourgeoisie who based ethics on God's commandments? On this point, we, of course, say that we do not believe in God and that we know perfectly well that the clergy, the landowners, and the bourgeoisie invoked the name of God so as to further their own interests as exploiters. You see, comment. You see, he's arguing against not God's commandments per se, but God's commandments in the context of the ruling class and their sentiment towards it and their teaching towards it. They don't reject ethics and morality per se. They're rejecting it in the sense given to it or the context given to it by the ruling class or the capitalists or the bourgeoisie. Because he says on this point, back to the reading, on this point, we of course say that we do not believe in God and that we know perfectly well that the clergy, the landowners, and the bourgeoisie invoked the name of God so as to further their own interests as exploiters. Or instead of basing ethics on the commandments of morality, on the commandments of God, they based it on idealist and semi-idealist phrases 
which always amounted to something very similar to God commandments. You see what he's explaining? He's not arguing against God and God commandments here. He's arguing against the bourgeoisie or the ruling class sentiment and sense of ethics, morality, and the commandments of God. And Lenin argued, they don't base truly, they don't base their ethics even on God commandments. They instead really truly base it on their idealist or semi-idealist phrases, which are something similar to God's commandments, but not God commandments. In this sense, they're saying that they reject religion. In this sense, they're saying we don't accept ethics and morals because they're saying, in a nutshell, they reject the false morals and ethics and the um, taking out of context the teachings of God commandments. This is what they reject. So back to the question. Back to the reading. But is there such a thing as communist ethics? Of course there is. Notice carefully. Back in the reading, task of the youth leagues. We say that our morality is entirely subordinated to the interests of the proletarian struggle, class struggle. Our morality stems from the interests of the class struggle of the proletariat. The old society was based on oppression of all the workers and peasants by the landowner and capitalists. We had to destroy all that and overthrow them. But to do that, we had to create unity. Something, that is something that God cannot create, going back to the context of their ideology and religion. See, their ideology and religion have caused individualism. Their ideology and religion have caused boastfulness, the division between ethnic groups, the division and subduing of genders and, 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 and causing the women to be descended down into domestic slaves. The religion of the bourgeoisie don't create unity. And this is what he's arguing. But the communists or their morality is based on the subordinate, subordinated interests of the proletariat or their morality is subordinated in subjection to the interests of the proletariat class struggle or struggle for liberation or the struggle for the oppressed. Just as we read in Isaiah, look at this morality that Lenin is confirming truly that they believe. Here in Isaiah 42, Isaiah, I'm sorry, not Isaiah 42, Isaiah 58. Let's read this again before we close for today's session. Isaiah 58, verse six. Surely this is the fast that I choose to break open the shackles of wickedness, to undo the bonds of injustice and to let the oppressed go free and to annul all perversion. Surely you should break your bread for the hungry and bring the moaning poor to your home. When you see, when you see a naked person, clothe him and do not hide yourself from your kin. Lenin is arguing that their ethics is based on exactly what we just read in Isaiah, subordinated to the interests of the proletarian's class struggle. The overthrow of the old society, which was based on oppression of all workers and peasants by the landowner and capitalists. We had to destroy that. We had to destroy that, it says in this writing. What did Isaiah 58 say? say break or destroy the bands of injustice. Let the oppressed go free. This is the ethic that Lenin says that they run upon. I sound like the ethic of the holy text of the scriptures. Let's move forward. Lenin argues back in the task of the youth leagues, to us, morality is subordinated to the interests of the proletariat's 
class struggle. This is agape. This is the agape that the Apostle Paul is making reference to. And this sort of agape changes the world. It changes the world. It sets the oppressed free. But in a context of the ruling class and their Western religion, when they use agape in their context, it brings oppression and shackles upon the oppressed. It tells the oppressed to remain oppressed and be still and rejoice in your oppressions until a man come out of the sky or until you disappear or until spaceships come or until a statue come alive and you are to go off and flee into the wilderness and hide yourself until a man come out of the sky. Okay. Some believe that. As of this moment, I'm not convinced of it. To us, morality is subordinated to the interests of the proletariat's class struggle. Continuing in the reading, the class struggle is continuing. It is the class struggle of the proletariat to prevent the return of the old exploiters, to unite in a single union the scattered masses of unenlightened peasants. The class struggle is continuing and it is our task to subordinate all interests to the struggle, not themselves, but to the struggle. Why? Because true charity does not rejoice in injustice. So their morality is to fight against injustice or the class struggle is continuing. And it is our task to subordinate all interests to that struggle. Our communist morality is also subordinated to that task. We say morality is what serves to destroy the old exploiting society and to unite all the working people around the proletariat, which is building up a new communist society. Yes, the proletariat means the workers. Let me ask you a question. Did Moses organize and gather the proletariat out of Egypt? Is it not written in Exodus, the first chapter, that the children of Israel built treasure cities for Pharaoh? Thus, we can conclude that they were the working class who built riches for the nobles and the aristocratic class. Can we also argue that Jesus of Nazareth, the historical Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua ben Dawid, can we also argue that he went to the proletariat to organize them for this task? Did he go to Levi who said, whose job was at the receipt of customs, a worker? Did he go to fishers, men who were mending their nets, to working on the seashores, laborers, was the Messiah himself a blue collar worker, a craftsman, a tradesman? Was he going to the proletariat? Did he delight in justice? Did he delight in equity? Did he and all those he gathered reject injustice? reject all forms of plunder and oppression. Thus, it can be concluded that their morality was subordinated to the task, a morality, we say morality is what serves to destroy the old exploiting society and unite the working people around the proletariat or the workers, which is building up a new communist society or building up a new society from a social renovation in whom the Hamashiach and the body of Messiah calls the kingdom of God on earth? Is this the context of the charity? Does this context of charity or agape fit neatly into the revolutionary struggle? Communist morality is that which serves this struggle and unites the working people 
against all exploitation, against all petty private property. For petty property puts into the hands of one person that which has been created for the labor, that which has been created by the labor, excuse me, of the whole of society. This is what must be abolished. This is what they're saying they're abolishing. They are abolishing injustice. Why? Because of this. Back to the reading. Morality serves the purpose of helping human society rise to a higher level and rid itself of the exploitation of labor. Rid itself of the exploitation of labor. And we know that the Messiah was against the exploitation of labor. James chapter five, verses one through four explains how James, the brother of the Messiah, or James or Hebrew name Jacob, he was fully aware of the exploitation of labor when he argued that the rich men stole the wages of those who labored for them. But those are the discussions. Now, if this fits neatly into our argument, then let us close our session with this. Psalms 146. Psalms 146, out of the stones edition. Psalms 146. Let's look at this out of the stones editions of the Tanakh. And let us look at three witnesses, the psalmist, the proverb of Solomon, and also the prophet Jeremiah. The psalm says this. Psalms 146, starting at verse 7, it reads, out of the Stones edition of the Tanakh, he, or Jehovah, is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. He safeguards truth forever. He does justice for the exploited. He gives bread to the home. Yehoah releases the bound or free the oppressed. He gives bread to the hungry and he breaks the shackles of oppression. How? Do we come down out of the sky and do it? Or according to the prophet Isaiah, he have dispatched his elect body, the body of Mashiach to do it. So again, he does justice for the exploited. He gives bread to the hungry. Yahuwah releases the bound. Yahuwah gives sight to the blind. Yahuwah strengthens the bent. Yahuwah loves the righteous. Yahuwah protects strangers, orphans, and widows. He encourages, but the way of the wicked he contorts. Yahuwah shall reign forever. Your Elohim, O Zion, from generation to generation. Hallelujah. Here it is, Yehoah labors and fights for the oppressed. How? By way of his elect, by way of his wind, by way of his rain, by way of his hornet, by way of his beetle, by way of his lightning, by way of his quake, by way of his hailstone. Let's go into Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. We pray for protection, that Jehovah deliver us and keep the peace where we are. But yet, in order to receive these benefits, we must labor in his behalf to do exactly what he said. And the character and the criteria, or should I say the characteristics that must be within the conscience is explained here in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, under charity, aka love or agape, moral preference. 
moral ethic. Look what it says in Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9. Open your mouth on behalf of the mule. Excuse me. Open your mouth on behalf of the mute. Open your mouth on behalf of the mute. In the judgment of all confused children. Open your mouth. Judge righteously. Obtain justice for the poor and destitute. Obtain justice for the poor and the destitute. Now, Yehoah does it. Now he is dispatching his elect servants to do the work so he can be glorified. Let's go into Jeremiah. As I said before, the Bible itself is a revolutionary catechism and that it is very important to read it according to its narrative and according to its theme. And, be, and I will argue that it is a good thing for us to question the present day narrative and the context of Western theology and Western Christianity. Because as we read earlier, many shall proclaim the name of Jesus or Yeshua HaMashiach. However, because of their works, he won't know them. Are they, are we, are all of us who seek to be a part of the messianic body? Are we taught these characteristics to internalize agape for the sake of the works of revolution, of breaking the bands of injustice and letting the oppressed go free? Look what the creator says in Jeremiah, 22nd chapter. Jeremiah, the 22nd chapter. Out of the Stones edition of the Tanakh, it reads thus. Starting at verse three. Thus saith Jehovah, administer justice and righteous or righteousness. Thus saith Yehovah, administer justice and righteousness and save the robbed from the hand of the oppressor. Do not taunt, do not cheat the stranger, the orphan and the widow. Do not spill innocent blood in this place. For if you carry out this matter, then there will continue to come through the gates of this place or this palace, kings of the line of David sitting on his throne, riding chariot and horses. So he told the ruling class and he told the people, administer justice. Save the rob from the hand of the oppressor. This is the theme. This is the narrative of the entire Bible. And we argued here in these sessions that the teachings of agape or the teachings of love and charity fit neatly and should be applied to the revolutionary teachings that bring forth a social renovation and removing the dehumanization of the masses of the people, removing the exploitation and plunder and robbery out of the earth, bringing forth a social renovation, which comes about by true repentance, thus bringing forth a revolution. And this revolution will bring forth salvation. Or liberty. Or it shall bring forth freedom for all men who seek the right paths. That will be it for today's session. God willing, we will also come again. I am Brother Judah. Uh, I uh, welcome all of the listeners who have taken the time out with us to join us in our podcast, What is to be Done. For further information, you can uh, look us up via webpage, 
www.thenmp.org or www.thecoi.org. You could visit us on a YouTube, Knesset Yeshua, K N E S S E T Y S H U A. Again, K N E S S E T Y S H U A. Or another YouTube page we have is the Nazarene Messianic Party. If you go to the home pages of these YouTube pages and click channels, you will find further content. So we're going to close today. And again, we approach the Bible from a social political perspective. And we argue this is the correct way to approach the Bible. And most high willing, we will be coming back again with more discussions and teachings. And for now, I would like to say peace to all of the people who are searching for truth. All of the people and listeners who are sincerely searching for the truth and the reality of the doctrines of the kingdom of God that are found in the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, in which we call the Revolutionary Catechism. Contact us. If you're looking at us on YouTube, feel free to contact us from the information on the screen and the number. If you are uh, visiting via website, look at the contact information and contact us. We try to make ourselves available. We are looking to organize and uh, find also those who want to learn more and be a part of this revolutionary movement according to the Holy Scriptures. So again, I greet you all who are sincerely searching in peace. Till the next time, we meet again.